Hello everyone and welcome back to Medzomedic. My name is Kitty and I'm an academic junior doctor working in the UK. Today we'll be talking about the Academic Foundation Programme or AFP. This video is aimed at penultimate or final year medical students who are thinking about applying to the AFP or what they're going to do after graduating medical school. In this video, we're going to be covering what exactly is the Academic Foundation Programme, including the structure of the AFP and types of AFP posts that you can do. We'll also talk about why you should apply to the AFP, when you can apply, and briefly cover the application process and what makes a strong application. Finally, I'll round off with some frequently asked questions about the AFP. So to start, what exactly is the Academic Foundation Program? The AFP is essentially a normal foundation program with built-in research time. If we look at a normal two-year foundation program, you'll see that there is six four-month clinical rotations that you have to do. In the AFP, however, you'll get dedicated time for research, which can come in several forms. You can get one four-month block in F2, which is purely for research and no clinical work, which is what the majority of deaneries will offer. The main complaint I've heard about this is the concern of de-skilling within these four months. In other deaneries, you can get something called an academic day release and clinical day release, which means that in your academic four-month block, you'll get one day a week for clinical work, and then in your clinical blocks, you'll get one day a week for academic work. I personally think that this is quite a good arrangement because it allows you to keep up with your clinical competencies during your academic block, and it means you can complete academic projects that are longer than four months because you have an academic day release in your clinical blocks. In other deaneries, you may only get the academic day release, which means that instead of getting a dedicated research block, your research time is purely spread across your six clinical rotations. Depending on how you work, this can be very useful. However, it also means that it might be harder to get a project going because you don't have a dedicated amount of time for it. In very few deaneries, you might even get more academic time than this with one research block in F1 and one research block in F2. The downsides of this is obviously the much reduced time for you to learn to be a clinical doctor. There are three types of academic posts that you can do, research, education, and leadership. A research-based AFP will allow you to attend university-led courses on research methodology and work with research departments to produce a meaningful and rigorous research project. An AFP with an educational focus will most likely require you to work closely with the undergraduate and postgraduate department of a hospital trust to design and provide teaching. Most education posts also allow you the opportunity to obtain a PG cert or a diploma in medical education, which you can build on further in the future to obtain a master's in medical education. And finally, a leadership and management AFP will aim to develop you as a clinical leader. This means that you'll be working closely with hospital trusts to improve patient care, reduce harm and mortality through conducting audits and quality improvement projects. Ultimately, the AFP is designed to be a taster and stepping stone for getting on the academic training pathway in the UK. Whilst the AFP runs alongside the normal foundation program seamlessly, after this, you can either go back to normal clinical training, or if you want to pursue academic interests, you can then apply for an academic clinical fellow post or an ACF post, where you will continue to get 25% research time. You can then become an academic clinical lecturer or ACL with 50% research time and usually people take some time out to do a PhD or MD project. Then you become a clinician scientist and finally a professor. The academic pathway tends to last a little longer than the normal clinical pathway because of the integrated academic research time, which means it will take you longer to achieve the same clinical competencies. Of course, if you do decide at any point that academia isn't for you, it is relatively easy to go back onto the clinical pathway. And in fact, there are many clinical consultants who conduct research in their own time without an honorary research association with the university. So why should you apply for an AFP? So the pros are, you get experience in clinical academia as we discussed, you get some dedicated research time, you get access to research academics and departments which might otherwise be harder to contact on your own, you get access to some funding to carry out your research projects, and it is generally a good opportunity to build your CV. Making the AFP application will also allow you to have some interview practice before your core and specialty training, Plus, it doesn't interfere with your normal foundation program application in any way. The downside to doing an AFP is that clinical academia can be challenging and stressful. You're expected to produce academic outputs for the university, so if you don't get a lot out of your two years as an AFP, this might be frowned upon on your CV compared to someone who went through the normal foundation program but did research on the side. The AFP application can be quite hard to do and time consuming, and overall, because of the integrated research time, you'll have less time to achieve the same clinical competencies as any other F1 or F2 doctor. You may also have less pay during your academic research block as a result of not doing out-of-hours work such as working on weekends or nighttime. So where can you apply to do an AFP job? 
The AFP is pretty much offered across all of the UK, and you can apply for two maximum deaneries at a time. Like normal foundation jobs, the competitiveness of AFP posts will vary depending on the location of the post, the programs they offer, and the prestigiousness associated with the trust. In some places, the competition ratio might be less than one. For the majority of AFP posts, the competition ratio is around one to three, and in more competitive areas such as Cambridge, Oxford, and London, it can be as high as six to one. The UKPFO publishes all of these competition ratios online every year, so you can Google and find out for yourself. Keep in mind that the competition ratios will fluctuate every year. In addition to that, not everyone who apply for a post will accept one if they have an offer, because they might have applied to two posts, or it doesn't actually suit their needs. So popular areas will always be popular, but don't let the competition ratios alone stop you from applying for an AFP post. Now let's talk about the application process for the AFP. The AFP application is completely separate to the normal foundation program with a different selection process. So applying for an AFP will not affect your application to a normal foundation program in any way, shape or form. If you do apply for an AFP, the results of the selection process will come out a few months before the actual foundation program ranking begins. This means that if you're offered an AFP post and accept it, you'll be withdrawn from the normal foundation program selection process. And equally, if you do not get an AFP post, you'll enter the same application process as everyone else for the normal foundation program. The AFP application on Oriel is essentially comprised of three components. The EPM score, which is your decile ranking within your medical school, additional achievements, which include additional degrees, up to 10 publications, up to 10 presentations and up to 10 prizes, and white space questions, which is essentially a personal statement of sorts. A combination of these scores will get you shortlisted for an interview, where you'll have stations such as managing a acute clinical scenario, critically appraising a research paper of abstract, and talking about yourself and your CV. And if you're successful through this whole process, then you might be offered a place. How this whole process is scored differs from deanery to deanery, and unfortunately, most of them are not transparent. There are a few deaneries that are an exception to this with a very good scoring guide, which you can find on their postgraduate website. So what makes up a strong AFP application? The three components, in my opinion, that makes up a strong application is a strong medical CV, strong answers to white space questions, and a good performance at the interviews. It goes without saying that if you're well ranked within your medical school and have additional achievements like we talked about, you'll be scoring better than other people who are applying. If you're wondering about how you can get these additional achievements as a medical student, I do have a separate series on my channel called CV Building for Medical Students, where you can check out how you can get involved in research, how to do audits, how to get prizes, etc, etc. So I won't go into detail for that here, but you can find the links for that playlist in the description below. White space questions are also a very important part of your application. In some deaneries, this is weighted very heavily, and in others, such as London, it is completely omitted. This is where you can demonstrate your achievements outside of what you've already listed on your Oreo application, such as research projects that haven't yet been published, audit projects that you've done, teaching and leadership experiences, and crucially, any non-academic achievements that provides translational skills to an AFP post. The key to writing white space questions is demonstrating transferable skills you've learned from other experiences and how you will apply this to your AFP post. And I'll be making another video which talks about this in more depth. When it comes to the AFP interview, the key to this is to practice with your peers, with your seniors, with anyone who will listen. Again, I will be making more videos to talk about the interview in depth, but essentially you want to demonstrate that one, you have good clinical knowledge as a future doctor, Two, that you can appreciate evidence-based medicine and know how to interpret a research paper, including its strengths and weaknesses. And three, selling yourself as a well-rounded person with a variety of skills that you can bring to the AFP. So there was a very quick run through of what the AFP is and what the application process involves. Now I'm going to address some frequently asked questions I've heard from other students about the AFP. So the first question is, how and where can I find more information about a particular deanery and their AFP posts? Unfortunately, as far as I know, at this point in 2020, there's no one place or one website that accumulates all of the information about all the academic posts offered across the UK. If you go to each research deanery's postgraduate education website, you'll generally be able to find some information on what types of AFP posts they offer, the structure of the program, and what types of research you can do. If you're looking for some specific information that isn't available online, you can always directly email the AFP program director of the trust or the postgraduate department directly and see if they can get back to you with any answers. A second frequently asked question is, should I apply to the AFP even if I'm not in the top three deciles, if I don't have a publication, or if I don't have lots of experience in a particular area? 
The short answer to this is yes, you should definitely apply. So the majority of applicants who are applying for AFP will not be scoring anywhere near the full marks that they can get for additional achievements. For example, for me, I didn't integrate in medical school and I had no extra degrees. How many points did that actually cost me? I don't know, but from the emails I've been having with various deanery leads, it sounds like it's about 5%, and I've made up for those points by having just a really good medical CV to back me up on my research experiences, etc, etc. Equally, I know someone who has no publications who applied and got a post, and many, many others who are not in the top three deciles of the medical school and still got into the AFP. I think an important thing to understand is that the application is designed to judge you as a holistic person and your potential to be a researcher. So if you can demonstrate this in your application and your interview, coupled with good clinical knowledge and ability to critically appraise a paper, I don't think not having a degree or not having a publication should be a factor at all. Everyone will bring something different to the table when they apply, and I think it's more about demonstrating your enthusiasm for research or education or leadership and your potential to excel in these areas that's going to really allow you to get the post. Another question is, what's the difference between doing a normal foundation program and conducting research in my own time versus doing an AFP? I think the main difference is access to other academics and dedicated research time. Of course, you can do research in your own time alongside a normal foundation program, but I think this can be quite stressful because you're leading a full-time job as a doctor, plus you don't get the support of an official supervisor in a research department to back you up. That being said, it doesn't mean that getting into AFP makes everything relaxing. If you want to produce a good amount of research output during your two foundation years, four months alone is often not enough to complete a meaningful research project. And as a result, many AFP doctors will do research in their own time even during their clinical rotations. For example, my academic F1 year is pretty much exactly the same as anyone else's F1 year with no dedicated research time, but I'm still doing research projects that I organized on my own and in my own time outside of clinical work. I think that clinical academia is very challenging and really requires you to be a very motivated individual. There is no guarantee that just because you got into AFP means that you would get a definite amount of publications or presentations out of it. And the amount of output you can get from an AFP post is highly variable from what I've seen. There will be individuals who achieve very amazing feats such as getting a randomized controlled trial started with NIHR funding and being an anatomy demonstrator at the same time at the university. And there will be others who only get a few poster presentations out of their time. And as I said earlier, if you do get an AFP post, you have the added pressure of expectations about your research output. I think the key message here is that AFP or not, clinical academia will require you to be very driven, very well organized and very dedicated. The dedicated time in an AFP program will help, but it is not the sole factor in determining how much you can get out of your two years. And lastly, if I do not apply for or do not get an AFP post, Will this preclude me from pursuing a career in clinical academia? So the short answer is no. Yes, the AFP will look good on your CV, and if you do get a lot out of it, then it will help a lot in your application to be an academic clinical fellow. However, I know plenty of academic fellows who have not done an AFP, and if you're driven enough to do research or educational leadership projects in your own time, alongside the normal foundation program, or perhaps you take an F3 year out to build your CV, I don't see a reason why you can't get an ACF post. And that wraps up the video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope this was useful for you. Please leave your questions in the comments section below and I'll try to get back to them as soon as I can. I'll be doing a few more videos in the future regarding writing the whitespace questions for the AFP and how to prepare for the AFP interview, so don't forget to subscribe so that you get notified when they come out. For those of you applying to the AFP this year in 2020, a few colleagues and I are also running mock interviews for AFP applicants from October to December. All the links will be in the description below if you're interested. That's it for now and see you in the next video!